We are so pleased that on this 10th anniversary, we get to have Ann Gribbins with us to be our dressage clinician. Welcome, Ann. This is a pleasure. It's a pleasure for me, too. I love being here. So far, it's been great fun. Have you ever been to the main event before? No. No. Have you, ever, have you ever been to British Columbia? Yes. I went to Vancouver once on a, a vacation, and uh, it was delightful. So I'm really happy to be back. It's a beautiful place. So you've had a few sessions so far with the uh, clinics here, yeah. and um, tell me what you've been working on. Well, we're trying to go up in a succession from the beginning, including the history of dressage a little bit, and up through the training scale, starting with the inexperienced horse at training level and first level, and to move up the training scale and also to see the horses becoming more and more advanced, more and more good at what they're doing and confident at what they're doing. So therefore we have horses of different age and different training stages. Now three days is a pretty short amount of time to do a lot and so what are you hoping to accomplish? Well, we don't have the same horses in all three days. Uh, so it's hard to see the succession. I was lucky enough to have a session last night and then today with two horses the same. And I think that made a bit of an impression. But an event like this is also mostly actually for the audience. It's a seminar more than a real riding lesson. Normally I wouldn't have more than one horse in a lesson. But for dressage, it, it's, that is so intense, it doesn't really work well. But it works in, in this respect, but only because the riders are aware that they are demo riders they are aware that I'm actually also trying to communicate with the audience, which is in this case very important. So they tolerate the fact that they don't get exclusive attention all the time. In a normal clinic, uh, the riders wouldn't like that. They would want your attention all the time because it is very picky, detailed and intense. If you, if you turn around and talk to somebody else, you sort of lose the moment and the focus. Do you find audiences are interested in being educated? I was amazed. I have done these events in the United States and uh, had some good response, but both yesterday and today it was actually a full house. They were very tuned in and they really listened because when I said something that was funny, they would laugh and they were, you know, you, you knew they were on it, they were listening. And uh, they'd be very supportive and they also have been very supportive of the riders. When a rider failed to do something, did it better, immediately they would applaud all by themselves. You know, they, would, they, they re recognized that it was difficult and they recognized that the rider had succeeded to improve. You have impeccable dressage credentials and I won't even begin to try to recite them all. So tell us a bit about your background. Uh, well, my background was, my grandfather was uh, uh, in the Swedish cavalry his whole life. So he actually taught me to ride when I was about five or six. And, uh, but then I never owned a horse. I rode other people's horses because my family couldn't afford a horse and we lived in the city of Gothenburg. So I never owned a horse until I came to the United States and got married. And um, I came here on a scholarship. Uh, so to, for college, so it wasn't at all to do anything with horses. But eventually I had to give up my, my education, so to speak, not give it up, I'm still using it. But, and uh, because I got so involved with the horses, we started just as a whim, you know, and then it became more and more intense. And after a while it was all about horses, and uh, that's how my whole life has been. And my husband and I have actually um, spent our entire life just doing everything you can with horses but my main thing has been dressage but we also did you know, I evented, I did hunters, I did equitation, I did some jumpers um, I'm not you know, strange right and that's all I did in Sweden was jumping but we get an education in Europe that's always based on dressage so when I first came here uh, I was ahead of the game from just the dressage I already had but then I also had some very good teachers. My mentor was Colonel Jönqvist, who was Swedish, happened to be Swedish, but I worked with him for eight years. And then they had the nerve to die. And then I was lost. And then I went over to Germany three times uh, 
three hardship tours with uh, with uh, Harry Bolt, who was an Olympic rider, Herbert Rebein, who was the best, unbelievable trainer, and uh, Dr. Moritz, who was also a top judge. So that's where I also got a lot of judging experience, listening to him, and he was my mentor as a judge. And that's how eventually I've also pursued that and have a judge's career, and I'm a, what they call now a five-star judge, an international Olympic uh, uh, judge. And um, there's only 30 of those in the world. So that's been a side view or a, a parallel track with the judging. But my, my first love is, is training horses and teaching interested students at any level. I don't care as long as they're on it and they want to learn. I love it. That's a rare quality in uh, some trainers who perhaps feel that they should only be training the best or, or top levels. Well, I got the opportunity to do that when I was the coach for the United States. So I went all the way as far as a trainer can go in that respect. And I totally enjoyed the elite riders and uh, going to all the games with them and helping them as much as I could. Uh, but that is very intense travel and not really on my time. I mean, you had to be where they wanted to be or had to be. And, uh, you know, it, and my husband is, is was not... He was very, very supportive, but he said, enough is enough. Uh, we, not, we need now to decide on our time. And uh, so I resigned in after, after the Olympics, but that was a fabulous opportunity as a trainer. But I will train at any level because the whole thing is that the, the, what is interesting is seeing it evolve, seeing, taking a young horse that is barely broken and making him to Grand Prix, which I've done many times or taking a young rider that, that is talented but raw, doesn't know, and bring them along and, and then see them becoming sophisticated and you know, showing well and so on. That's, that's really, really rewarding. Do you have any thoughts on the state of the equestrian industry or equestrian sports at this time? Well, we, we're trying this, but we only have 40 years in, in, in North America, basically, of real dressage understanding, and, and I think the USDF is about 40 years old, and uh, that's when it all started. Before that, there was nothing here of an organized nature, and people couldn't really understand the word, and it was all sort of out there. And now, we have certainly worked hard. We do still need to breed more top horses. We have, I had three horses that were lovely in there, lovely. And they were all bred here in Canada. So it's coming, but it's slow. Breeding takes forever. It's a labor of love, it takes forever. And we have many good riders that have developed over the years and have gotten the training that I did, like I did in Europe, and now we don't need to do that anymore. We have trainers in, in North America that can train just as well as the trainers in Europe. But we still need top, top quality horses to sit on for these good riders. And uh, we need to go and compete over there when our horses are ready. Mm. And more, even more than we do. But with, with re quality horses that really are up to their standard. Mm. And it's, it, it'll happen. It's just, it, and it goes in waves. You know, we go up and down some years, we have a lot of good horses to choose from. Wonderful, some years like right before the Olympics for the United States was a really low year and we had very few to choose from. And the ones we had were lovely, but a couple of not, just the quality that we already ran away from us. And, and uh, you know, but that's the, that's the way it is in the sport. Horses, uh, horses are very fragile and uh, they don't last forever and they have a very short actual you know, shell life if you want. And then and that's between they're fully trained and when they get too old to do it. There's a very short period that you hope to get the most that they can give you out, out of them. But they're a long time before. And then of course on the other end you have to still take care of them and thank them for what you did, what they did for you. So, but it's it definitely not, not gonna go away. Dressage is on the up and up. Finances lately, all over the world, but also especially in the United States, has been pretty glum. 
but it's slowly recovering, but it is slow. And that affects the sport as well. Hard to get sponsorship, hard for people who have good horses to get to the horse show, difficult for them to stay up with it because, hey, first, first you have to take care of your basic needs before you can go off to horse shows. And that has a little bit slowed things down. I think that's what happened before the Olympics mm -hmm. a lot. It was just such a slow economy that nothing new happened. No new horses were imported and no, you know, it, it, just, it just stagnated. Mm -hmm. But I think that's over. It's starting to, to come back. Uh, you mentioned that you're educating the uh, spectators here at this event. Mm -hmm. If there's one thing that you would want either the riders or the spectators here to take away from your presentations this weekend, what would it be? Well, for the ones that aren't familiar with research, that they, be, they develop an interest in it and they, they want to know more. I just had a lady come up to me who says she's riding Western, but could I recommend a really good research book for her because she's interested. That's what I like. Those are the ones we want to hook and drag into the game, of course. And then we'd be happy to educate them more. Because we want more people to be interested in it. And it is good for all disciplines. And I got friendly with Stormy, who was out there with uh, her barrel horses. And we had a, have a lot of interesting conversations about our sports. And I know she could get on my horse and ride it. And I know I could ride hers, because some similarities are really clear to us. You know, a horse is a horse and some different methods when you are a, a competent rider can be easily explained to you and you can apply them. So the, I like to see the versatility is great. And for the people who already know dressage, I'd like for them to come with their questions. We have a question and answer thing tomorrow and I'd like for them to come and ask me whatever questions they want, you know, about, about the dressage, about the horses, about their own horses, about equipment, whatever they need to talk about. So that I hope somebody or everybody gets goes away with something that they thought, okay, that was worth it. I'm glad I went. Thank you, Anne Gribbons. It's an absolute pleasure to have you here with us. Thank you. I really like it.